Welcome to Bromley Healthcare speech and language therapy training video. I'm a speech and language therapist working for Bromley Healthcare and this training is on selective mutism. Although I will be referring to children, this training also applies to young people too. This training is an overview of selective mutism and will hopefully give you some insight into the condition and introduce you to some of the principles of working with children who are selective talkers. When working with these children, it is vital to work as a team, including parents in that team, as well as your speech and language therapist school, and if you have one, your CAMS team. This condition is called selective mutism, and sometimes this misleads people into thinking that the child is choosing who they will and will not speak to. In fact, this is not the case. It is the child's fear that is causing them to be silent in situations where they feel overwhelmed. And we will explore this more. This information is based on the Selective Mutism Resource Manual by Maggie Johnson, who is a specialist speech and language therapist working in this area. I would recommend this book to you as a resource. It is full of photocopyable resources, practical tips and a programme of activities and is a valuable resource for schools. So, what is selective mutism? Selective mutism is a social phobia. That means that a child or person feels unable to talk in certain social settings. Generally, they are happy to talk at home with their immediate family and find it harder to talk with some wider family members and it may mean that they only speak a little or do not speak at all at school. Have a look at the slide and see some of the descriptions that children have given about their selective mutism. As I said, it is a social phobia. Some of you may have been shocked when you saw the photo of the spider, as you may have a phobia of spiders. I'm sorry, I hope you're okay. Others may not like spiders or may not have a problem with spiders. So for this part, you will need to think of something that you are scared of. We need to think about what it is like to have a phobia and to put ourselves in the child's position. So if it's spiders for you, or maybe it's the dentist or lifts, what are the things we experience when we are scared or even terrified? We experience body tension, maybe we even freeze. Our thought processes may desert us and we don't know what to do. We may even shut down. We will seek to avoid challenging or scary situations and we may feel helpless or find it difficult to put into words what we are feeling and why we are feeling as we do. Selective mutism is a social phobia so children and young people with selective mutism experience all these feelings to a greater or lesser extent in social situations. So if we acknowledge this fear it will help us to know how to help these children and young people. Again, put yourself in a child's place. If you have a fear of spiders, I'm not going to help you by putting a tarantula on your hand or even near you. This is the same as trying to make a child with selective mutism talk. If I'm trying to help you, I will have to break everything down into very small steps and these steps will be tailored for each individual. Maybe bigger steps for some, maybe smaller steps for others. I would need to start where you felt comfortable and move up in small steps. Another useful picture is to think about a child who is scared of the dark. When they wake terrified, we don't try and make them go back to sleep in the dark. We turn the light on and then work towards a long-term goal of being comfortable in the dark. Applying this to selective mutism, we need to understand the fear, reduce the child's overall anxiety, help the child face the fear, but one tiny step at a time, So, selective mutism is diagnosed when we see a phobia of speaking to or being heard by certain people, a consistent pattern of talking and not talking, and where this pattern has lasted at least two months in a new setting. We can also see that it is maintained by other people's behaviour. For example, telling people the child doesn't speak or not giving the child the opportunity to respond, or maybe even giving affection 
when they are not responding rather than when they make small steps of progress. So although it is maintained maybe by other people's behaviour, this is not to say that we're at fault. Um, children, it, People in the children's environment are not at fault here. It's just that sometimes some of the things we do for the best reasons don't always help. What else do we know about selective mutism? Well, there are various types. There's pure selective mutism, um, which, as we said, is something where there's been a speech phobia which has lasted more than two months. There's selective mutism which occurs alongside a speech or language impairment or where English has been learnt or is being learnt as an additional language. There's complex selective mutism which may occur alongside other diagnoses, sometimes alongside autistic spectrum disorder. And there's traumatic selective mutism which is very rare. We also know that more girls are affected than boys and that the most frequently reported age of onset is between three and five years. This affects approximately one in 150 children and there is known to be a higher incidence in bilingual families and in children who have speech and language difficulties. Hopefully your child is known to a speech and language therapist and if they are not, then I suggest that that would be a, a good referral to make. The role of the speech and language therapist is more as a facilitator in, with, in children with selective mutism um, because the most important thing is that the child talks with key people, so not with the speech and language therapist, but key people, for example, school staff, other members of the family. So the role of the speech and language therapist is to assess the language and social interaction skills um, as children with difficulty with their language skills are more at risk, as we said. And also there is a link between um, social communication difficulties and selective mutism. We may also look at a talking map to understand who the children talk to, who they do not talk to, what is the pattern there. Help to identify a school key worker and support the key worker with implementing a behavioural programme. And support that within the, the context of the family as well and also work with others for example parents, um, educational psychologists and maybe a CAMS worker. Let's look at factors which contribute to the development or the maintenance of selective mutism. First predisposing factors. These include the child's personality. You may find that many children with selective mutism are more sensitive in their nature or they may have perfectionist tendencies. Also, a history, family history of anxiety or mental illness may be a predisposing factor. There are also certain events that may trigger selective mutism in children who already have predisposing factors. These include loss, separation, a significant change, or maybe disapproval or teasing about um, factors like their communication. Once a child has selective mutism, some factors may contribute to maintaining it. These may be things that are done for the best motives. For example, it may be that to protect our children, we might over accept their selective mutism and not encourage them to achieve and to, to, to take the small steps towards talking. Or on the other hand, we might um, encourage or cajole a child to speak. Both these can be maintaining factors. The lack of appropriate and early intervention is also a factor in maintaining the condition. So this whole talk is for parents and school staff, but the following two slides are specifically aimed at parents. There is also a handout for parents that go to this, so do ask your speech and language therapist about getting hold of this. So advice for parents about supporting your child and really this is about all aspects of life so ensuring your child feels valued and secure whether they're talking or not maybe not quizzing them about their talking so rather than when they get home saying did you manage to talk to your teacher today or ask them what was hard or what was difficult don't don't focus on that don't ask them questions about how they've succeeded or not with their talking 
Reassure them that everyone grows up with childhood fears and that things will get easier as they get older. Be calm and relaxed. Try not to be angry or embarrassed about their talking because they'll pick up on that. Focus on what your child can do. It's too easy to get dragged into focusing on the things that your child finds difficult, but focus on what they can do. Educate family and friends about selective mutism and about how to communicate with your child. Help them to understand that it's not that your child is choosing not to speak to them or that they're being rude, but it's that it is an actual fear. Provide support for play dates and trips so that these are successful and positive. Keep busy. Outdoor activities often have less focus on communication, so they can be a good thing for a, selective, a child with selective mutism to do. And maybe have a routine if that's useful to reduce anxiety. Don't avoid activities, but make them easier, so build in those small steps towards doing them. Be with your child as a general helper, but don't be their personal assistant. By that, I think what we mean is don't do everything for them. So we still want the child to be trying to do things. Help your child offload their stress safely. So this is a stressful situation. Children can feel very stressed um, in situations when they're expected to talk or after when they've had a, a social interaction with somebody and it hasn't been easy. So think of ways that they can offload that stress. Show your child that it's okay to relax and have fun. Maybe even laughing, laughing out loud can be difficult in some situations for children. And remember that it can be just as scary talking to some children as to adults. If your child has difficulty with understanding language or they have speech difficulties, then help them by making instructions and explanations as easy as possible and use lots of visuals to help them and help develop their language skills. Establish safe boundaries with your child so they can take small steps forward. So that means not prote overly protecting them, but allowing them to, to make steps. Maybe try using telephone or recording on your mobile because these can be small steps towards just talking to in everyday situations. And if your child is very anxious about going into a situation and asks you lots of questions, who's going to be there, what's going to happen, maybe try and help them to become the problem solver. So say, so who do you think is going to be there? Are any of those people going to be make it more difficult for you? What could we do to help with that? So your child becomes the problem solver. So although a child with selective mutism is reluctant to talk, we still do have to give opportunities to communicate. So when I say opportunities, I do mean opportunities, not expectations. There's a difference. Maybe make sure that other children give them the opportunity to respond so they're not talking for them. Some may be able to talk or play with a friend and encourage this. Talking through others can be helpful, but make sure that your child doesn't become over-reliant on this. And accept gesture or nodding, but don't actively encourage nonverbal behaviours. This is the same with using communication books or communication aids to help a child. Again, there is a fine balance between giving the child a way of communicating through symbols or written words and allowing this to become the only way they communicate. It should ideally be a support strategy towards the ultimate goal of speaking. We can help support these opportunities through helping the child to relax. This may be talking to the child and commenting on what is going on rather than asking lots of questions. Avoiding direct questions unless they require a yes, no response. Making comments such as, I wonder, I wonder what we might have for tea tonight, which gives the opportunity to speak, but doesn't mean that the child is forced to. And avoiding too much contact, eye contact. So we've looked a bit about some general principles and what causes it. Now let's look at how, what we can do to help. So working with a child involves a number of stages. The first stage is education, which involves helping others in the child's life to understand about selective mutism 
and it aims to reduce the pressure on the child and to create a positive communication environment. There's also a stage in which we need to explain to the child themselves so that they can understand what to expect and therefore their anxiety hopefully is reduced or at least managed. We want them to have some control in the process that they're going to be going through. We need to set up a programme with small steps so that the child is challenged but never pushed beyond their comfort zone. These steps work towards developing speech with the key worker. And in the last stages, we also need to keep an eye to the future so that we can get the transition of these skills into other places and with other people. And also actively manage transition to new classes or changes of school. We'll now look at these steps in more detail. Education. As I said, this is about creating the right environment. We need to increase the understanding of everyone in the child's environment in order that the child is not put under any pressure from any quarter. This may include supporting parents to know how to deal with other adults talking to their child, considering what the maintaining factors might be and encouraging risk-taking rather than avoidance by providing opportunities rather than increasing expectations. Even well-meaning cajoling is not helpful, but equally, ready acceptance of selective mutism prevents the child seeing that a change is possible or desirable. We also need to help the child in terms of how they understand their difficulties. As it is a phobia, the difficulties can seem overwhelming, so it's important to acknowledge the difficulties, but also help keep them in perspective. In terms of practicalities, it is possible to allow children to communicate through their friends, but it is important that this does not become a maintaining factor. We also have to help the child understand what's happening, so educating them as well, and talking positively and openly. It's not helpful to ask the child why they don't talk, but it is helpful to try and put the child's feelings into words. For example, talking to new people can feel scary to begin with, So scary, sometimes your words get stuck and don't come out. But that's okay, you don't need to talk to play these games that we're going to be doing today. Or you may want to reassure, there are other children who find it hard to talk sometimes, it's not just you. Or, it won't always be like this, talking will get easier. So it's about talking positively and helping the child to understand a bit more of what they're going through. Have a look at the next slide and see for some examples of what you as a key worker might say to a child. So let's look now at program planning. We've looked a bit about the background of selective mutism and some of the ways that we can help a child feel more comfortable and some of the advice around supporting a child's environment. But now let's look at the actual steps and programme that can be used to support the child. Basically, the aim of this programme is that we identify a key worker who the child will develop their confidence with so that ultimately they can talk to them. This may require that a parent is involved because the child will feel comfortable with the parent and will be talking to the parent and it may require that the parent is present at first in order to facilitate the child feeling comfortable and moving towards being comfortable with the key worker. Let's look at the different stages of this. So rapport building. In rapport building, We're basically trying to get the child to feel comfortable with this key worker. It may be that the child is happy to play with the key worker with a variety of favourite activities and games without the parent present, or it may be that at first a parent does need to be present to give the child that reassurance. These games and activities should be non-verbal games, so something that we can do without any requirement by the child to talk. So we're taking the pressure off, we're letting the child know that there is no need to talk, but we're just here to have fun. And so we're working through various 
types of nonverbal play, maybe encouraging sounds in play, including sounds with music makers, maybe working towards um, a child feeling comfortable enough to laugh or maybe make sounds in the play. And once we're beginning to get that confidence with the nonverbal play, so with play without talking, then we can gradually start to increase the expectation on producing sound. But there can be a lot of work just at this rapport building stage when there is no focus on speech. Once the rapport has been established, the child is completely confident, confident in this environment, then we can move on to maybe sliding in. That's the technique that we're going to talk about in a little while. So sliding in so that the child begins to talk to the key worker. But something I just want to go through with you first is communication load. Because when we're thinking about talking, all speech and talking is not the same. So there are things which a child is going to find easier and there are things that a child is going to find harder. And it's important to be aware of this when we move on to this step of sliding in, of help, helping the child to communicate with this new person around them. So things that are easy to communicate, have a low communication load, are things that are learned by rote. So maybe saying numbers together or days of the week, that sort of thing. Yes and no has a low communicative load, especially if there's no risk of getting something wrong. Um, talking together, so actually talking at the same time as each other, so maybe counting out loud together is useful as well. And um, eliciting language, so maybe in sentence completion, so um, maybe put in the end of um, a, a nursery rhyme, so twinkle, twinkle, little star. High communication load would be things where um, there's no planning and the child has has got to say what they want. They haven't got time to plan. They've got to say an answer. That's a high communication load. That's stressful, um, especially if they're not sure if their answer is acceptable. And if they're giving their opinions or their ideas, that increases the communication load. So this is a useful thing to think about when you're ready to move on to the next stage. So sliding in, I've mentioned this technique. It's a technique that speech and language therapists use to help a child um, become confident speaking with somebody who they didn't used to speak with. So we've done the rapport building and um, now we're ready to do our sliding in technique. And it's really used for children with selective mutism who are five years or older. It follows a very structured approach. So the key worker or an additional adult is gradually introduced to the, smart, the child in small steps. So it may be that the child is with the parent and gradually the key worker is added in, or it may be that the child has got to the level of talking with a key worker and an additional adult, another person who's going to become an additional adult is, ad, is gradually introduced to the child. It's important to start this process in a quiet private room. So you're going to need somewhere where the, where the key worker and the child with or without the parent can go and the child needs to feel comfortable there. Uh, the, the adult who's going to be slid in will not be in the room at first so you might be doing the rapport building with, um, with your key worker or you might have the parent and the child in this room to start with and then the person to be introduced will gradually be introduced to that setting. So it might be, might be that the new adult starts outside with the door closed and then gradually comes closer to the door. Maybe then the door is left ajar and they, the child can hear somebody's outside, maybe see somebody's outside, but the person is not going to go into the room. It's important to um, only go as far as the child is comfortable. So we don't want the child to stop talking. So if they're talking and you come to the doorway, and they stop talking, then we've gone too far. And it's important to acknowledge this as the adult's mistake. And you can always go back a step. So you can say to the child, oh, I'm sorry, that was too much. I'll just stand outside. It's really important not to rush this. It can take several sessions. So it's really, really important not to rush it. Once the child can tolerate the new adult, 
so the key worker if they're working with their parent or the new adult if they're working with a key worker, once they can tolerate that person in the room with them and still speak, then it would be good to start working on specific tasks with low communication load um, to just gradually get the child to um, start communicating with the adult. And this is the sort of thing that you'll get support from your speech and language therapist with. It's also important to think about changing one thing at a time. So it may be that um, if the child is happy talking in one room with a key worker, maybe you try using a different room with the same key worker. So you're changing location. Or it may be that um, if they're happy talking with a key worker doing rote tasks, so counting, or filling in blanks in a song, it may be that you change the activity slightly so that it's slightly higher communication load. So it's important to change one thing at a time and help the child to get used to that before changing something else. When you're doing the sliding in approach, there should be no surprises or shocks for the child. So they need to be informed of what's gonna happen and be part of that and you can record this so you can maybe make a little visual scale for them so they can see what the steps are and they can be involved in ticking off those steps as they achieve them um, so that's a, a nice thing to do with them if you don't have the option of using the sliding in technique for example if there is um, if, the, if a parent can't help with the sliding in process then there is another method called eliciting speech. I'm not going to go into that in detail, um, but again, you would need to work with your speech and language therapist on this. And just as some other um, examples of things that are helpful, desensitisation can be helpful. So we know that this is a phobia. We know that they don't like hearing themselves or talking with other people. So maybe having audio or videotape of them talking at home and bringing that into school so that other children around them can see that they do talk and also they get used to hearing their voice. That can be a useful, um, a useful way of, of supporting as well. And obviously we've said that it is a very small, we, we're going in very small steps and we're going systematically. So it's really important to um, continue with this small step approach. So now you've got to the stage when your child is happy to talk with a key worker at school, which is great. And we've got to think about generalising this. So that's the next stage. And it's really important to reassure the child, to keep them knowing that we're going to be going at their pace. So obviously with generalising, we're really wanting eventually for the child to be talking in class. But that's a massive jump. So it may be that the next stage is um, to introduce another key worker or maybe the class teacher can be involved and can go through the sliding in process with the first key worker. But it's important to tell the child there's no expectation to talk in class yet. Generalisation is also about changing one thing at a time. So as I said, maybe you might be sliding in a new person and sliding out the original people. Maybe you'll be increasing the number of people present in the safe room. Maybe you'll be changing location or maybe you'll be increasing, increasing the communication load, but it's only one thing at a time. And then when we come to the stage of generalising into class, there are some obvious things here that we've got to be realistic about our expectations and not to expect the child to use speech in a whole class activity until, for example, half the class and the teacher have heard their voice during in sliding activities or the child can read um, or talk to a TA or the teacher in a classroom while other children are doing something else. Um, so, you know, again, there are, there are stages to follow. We need to make sure that um, we're not putting too high an expectation when we're generalising into class. As part of generalisation, um, we need to think about generalising to the community as well because obviously the child might be wanting to talk in shops and things like that, but that's something um, that I'm not going to cover here. So the last stage is transition. And we know that change um, can create fear. It can create fear in all of us. It can be a natural part of the process of change. 
So it's really important with children with selective mutism to think about managing transitions, managing change. So it may be something that we don't really think about just going up a year in, or changing a new to a new class or having new staff in the class or a new teacher or even changing school. So it's really important to manage these transitions, maybe um, giving the child photographs, doing visits, meeting the new member of staff, all those things that are going to break down the, their level of anxiety and help them to cope with that change. So in summary, the key principles are that we want to reduce anything that reinforces the selective mutism. We want to fully involve the child at every step of the process. We need to build a good relationship between the child and the key worker through that rapport building. We need to understand the progression, so the small steps that are needed, and keep the child's anxiety to a minimum. We need to accept that the child does want to speak, even though they're silent, and sometimes that can be hard to do. We need to um, explain to the child that we know it's going to be difficult, but that it won't always be that way. And we need to avoid putting pressure on them by bribery or threats or persuasion. And the flip side, we need to provide incentives to speak to show them that communication can be enjoyable. And I think it's really important to work, recognise that working with the child may be hard for everybody, for the parents, for the teachers, and there can be frustrations along the way, but there can be a, an awful lot of positives as well. Um, so it's, it's just important to acknowledge that. The last slide um, shows some resources. It shows the uh, resource manual that I said that a lot of this information is taken from, and I'd really recommend that you got that. And then there are also some websites and some books that might be useful for you um, because they... Uh, might be useful for your child they take it from the perspective of the child thank you very much for listening to this i hope it's been useful it's quite difficult to get everything across um in in um this format but this is like i said an introduction and the steps and the processes are things that you will need to discuss with your speech and language therapist and with the, um, everybody involved in the, in the process to support the child with selective mutism. Thanks very much. Bye-bye.